So I'm going to talk about Roundup Extend, uh, the Roundup Extend system. Um, I know they sell the Roundup Extend soybeans here. And uh, so we're going to review some of the things that, uh, uh, first, what we talked about last winter in the training, and then what we learned uh, once we started doing our spraying. So, I don't know, roughly we probably sprayed a thousand some acres last year in our testing and our seed production, but now, you know, this year, so it was like 20 million acres we planted, maybe half of that was sprayed. So, you know, there was a lot, a lot of uh, product being applied, and so we learned a lot. I mean, applicators learned a lot, farmers did as well. So uh, that's what I'm going to review today. So I'm going to throw out some uh, acronyms at you. So, you know, letters that stand for something. Uh, so DRA, anybody know what DRA stands for? Drift, reduction, agent, okay? Drift reduction agent. And this is a sample here, okay? It's a plant-based guar-based, looks like liquefied snot that you put in your tank mix. Now, who told us we had to use DRA in our tank mixes with Roundup? Extend the max with Roundup. Who told us we had to do that? It's another acronym. EPA. Yeah, there you go. Okay. EPA. Yeah, I thought Trump was going to take care of that, but he hadn't got, to, got around to it. So I'll pass this around. So uh, DRAs. This was something new. We didn't know this was coming. This was a mandate from the EPA in uh, about March of this year. All right. So uh, it's a drift reduction agent. EPA requirement for tank mixing, Extendamax, and Powermax. And the reason why is because all the different tank mixes that have to be on the label go through a wind tunnel testing. Okay? And they, they do all these different tank mixes, and if there's any particle drift outside of their parameters in this wind tunnel, then they either don't label it, or they say you have to use DRA. So when they put Roundup and Extendamax together, they found that there were some particles that went outside their parameter, and so that's why DRA is required. Okay? We didn't know that was coming until March, so this is something we had to learn. Um, the testing for DRAs, I did some a few years ago, and this is the tip now that's required for the use with Extendamax. Now there's other tips now that's, that's available that you can use, but this was the first one. This was the TTI Turbo T Induction Tip, okay? And it produces these great big ultra coarse droplets. Actual size here. No, I'm just kidding. But big droplets, and big droplets don't do what? They don't drain it, right? So that's why these were these were used. So I'll pass that around if you haven't seen one. Um, the problem is when we use the DRAs with these tips, my spray pattern started like this, and then when I put the DRA in, the spray pattern went like that. So what happens when that occurred? Need more tips. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Yeah, that, that corrected. That's more sense to you. Losing your overall. You're going to miss weeds, right? You're going to have skips. And so, so when I started, when I looked at DRAs and these tips, they don't go together. They don't like each other. Um, at 1%, that was the rate that we used. So our recommendation is half that. So use a half a percent volume of volume. So in other words, if you've got a 250 gallon tank of water, uh, half a percent of that would be the DRA. Uh, that you would have. Okay. Um, again, this is all from a from a drift standpoint. Okay. And that's what the DRA is that is, is is there for. Now, some of you guys, uh, of course, you always <coughs> farmers are the best researchers, I think, because they take stuff and they think, well, I think I can tweak it and make it better. Some guys uh, found good results with a quarter percent. Okay. So that's okay if you want to do that, but DRA is required if you're tank mixing certain uh, tank mixes. Now, the other question is, when do we add this DRA? And the answer is, um, first. We recommend that you add it to the tank mix first, and then start adding it. Yes, sir. I guess I, I might have misheard or something. If they don't like the TTI tips, what tips do they want then? Or did you say that? Okay, yeah. They want, do they want just flat fans? Or, or? No, flat fans are not. Are I mean, not if they don't want an air induction tip, what do they want? Okay, so 
to answer that, you have to go to the website, huh? the Stimax application requirements. Oh, that's, that's what we call the label now. And it gives you a whole range of tips that you can use. Flat fans aren't on there because they make this is too small of a drop. Uh, TTIs are on there, but that's the, that's the T-Jet brand, but there's also Wilbur, there's also Hypro, there's Greenleaf, so if you're one of those brands, yeah. Is the DRA plug the TTI chip? Yeah. At the higher rate, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the DRA is added to the tank, it's not on with the extend? Correct, you have to buy it and add it to the tank, yeah. So the the thought was, or the recommendation is you add it first, um, and then you start agitating, and then you start adding your other products later. Um, and the reason is we've had some guys that put it in last, and who's got the jar? Right. If you pour that in last and without agitating, guess where that's going to go? It's heavier than everything else in the tank, so where's it going to go? All the way to the bottom. Yeah, and then that's really, you really got a mess. So put it in the tank first. Uh, the different DRAs have different labels, and some say, well, you put it in, in the middle when you're, when you're in the, the middle order of tank mixing, but we recommend you put it in first. And again, where do you go to find this information? It's a website. So this is, I know this is a complete shift in our thinking and, and what we've done in the, in the, the last several decades. And that is the label that's on the jug is the conventional label. That's not the extend label. You have to go to this website to find these application requirements. So the supplemental label is what we're using then to spray over the top of round of extend soybeans. Okay. So let me repeat that. The label that's on the jug. Okay. For years and years, right? That's the label that you read. That's what we require. Uh, in this case, the supplemental label isn't on the jug, it's at this website. Now, don't shoot arrows at me, that wasn't my idea. <laughs> this is EPA's thing, okay? But here's, but here's the point. If you look at Roundup, PowerMax, there's seven different supplemental labels for Roundup. They're not going to tape seven different labels to a jug. It just doesn't make sense. So if you want to know if you can spray Roundup on peanuts, you've got to go to CDMS website or the Monsanto website and find that supplemental label. So that's where we're at. Uh, my thought, and hopefully they'll do this, is print the website right on the jug. So it's there and then they can go to it and see the information. Alright, so enough of the DRAs. Next acronym is GPA, and not grade point average. That's completely different. Don't want to bring that up. But gallons per acre. So what is the, um, anybody knows what the minimum gallons per acre of extended max is? This is water we're talking about. How much water? What's the minimum amount of water we need to extend max? Anybody have an idea? 15. Okay, I'll give you a choice. 5, 10, or 15. Remember when you're in college, you always choose, choose B. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always choose B. It's 10. That's the, that's the minimum, all right? Well, 10 doesn't cut it. That's what we found. Um, we control is much better at 15. Because at 15, we got more coverage. We got better coverage. Especially when we're mixing all this stuff together in the tank. You get Extendamax and Roundup and a non-AMS water conditioner and a DRA and your surfactants and blah, 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 blah. It just turns into a mess, right? So uh, if you raise that gallonage per acre, you get better coverage, less antagonism, and it works. Okay. So we would like for you to shoot at 15. I know that's more water. It's probably going to carry more water within that sort of thing. But uh, a lot of the applicators, you know, the CPSs of the world and the series, uh, they've started at 15 and, and then gone up from there and found that it's really, really helpful. So 10 is not, not going to cut it. So better coverage for dense foliage, larger weeds. The PSI, so um, the range for the, for the pressure for this tip, something like uh, 30 to 60. And I run it at 40 for my research, and that's about where I want to go because I'm walking on, so I can't 
and I can't run with a backpack sprayer. So I have to check, I have to uh, use 40. But uh, you want to keep that pressure near the, near the top of that range because, again, it helps with, uh, with weed control. So there's a balance, right? There's a balance between weed control and drift. Uh, so we need to manage drift, but we also want to get good weed control. So that's kind of what you're going to have to try to figure out is where you want to be with that. Uh, but we like 15 gallons per acre. Okay, uh, I've been mentioned about tank mixes. So everybody wants to throw it all in at one, one pass, right? I don't want to go across this field more than once, so I'm going to throw everything in the tank and be done with it. Um, I call that the witch's brew. <laughs> um, so if you've got Extendamax and Powermax and, and the residual herbicides and then the water conditioners and all this stuff going in the tank at once, we have problems. And we saw that this year, especially early on, when we were spraying a burn down, back when it was uh, cold. We had a lot of cold nights in April. And so the result was antagonism. These, some of these herbicides don't like each other, so compatibility issues. And, uh, and this whole DRA thing, guys were learning about this, you know, that was, that was gumming up things. And so it was just, in, in some cases, it was just a disaster. So here's my recommendation. Let's decouple some of these products. Let's, let's take out the residual if you're going out early in a burn down. Okay? So in this area, our early burn down could be fall. Could be this fall. Go in and spray after harvest, uh, extended max and power max, or it could be 2,4-D and whatever grain of dicamba you want. Doesn't matter. Very economical and very, very effective. Uh, we've done this for a number of years. The next spring, my trials, my, my plots are clean, okay? Um, fall of the year is when the weeds are small, they're actively growing, they're very, very susceptible at that stage. You know, you know a nice warm October day is very, very effective when you spray in the fall. In the south, they don't like spraying in the fall because they got a lot of hills, and when they take away that weed cover on the hills, what happens? You get water, right? You get erosion. So uh, fall applications typically don't work in, in, the, in the south. So you'll have clean fields of planting. So that's when you can put your trees on, okay? So then you can go back and then at planting time, put on your Valor or your Authority Max or your Warrant or your Sinport or whatever, and, uh, and not have to put it on uh, with the burn down. Or you can go early spring with the burn down and then follow residuals of planting. So you find a nice warm uh, week in uh, April, put on your Roundup and extend them axe or Roundup 2,4-D, whichever one of you want to use there, and then at planting time, use your residual herbicides. Or, here's another option. You can just forget the residuals altogether at planting and put them on in your first pass uh, through the field. Whether you're using Roundup and Warrant together or, or Prefix as popular herbicide or anything like that can be used with extend them axe in that first crop. So lots of different options that we can use then uh, so that we don't have to do all this tank mixing with the burn. Mix. Okay, environment. So we had an environment this year. <laughs> we have environment every year, right? Uh, so we've had a really cold period. And uh, so this is going to affect our weed control. Here's the problem we have. Extend the max and round up our Systemic herbicides. What's that mean? Systemic. What do they do? Yeah, they move in the plant, right? They don't burn off the foliage. They move in the plant. So if the weeds aren't working, the herbicides aren't working, right? The weeds are shut down because it's too cold. Then they're not taking in the herbicide and they're not moving around. We want a happy weed. You know, we want a weed that's happy and, and photosynthesizing. And if it's growing well, then it's translocating its sugars. Moving its sugars to its growing points, and that's when it's going to move round up and extend the mix. So, in a lot of these cases where we didn't get the right burn down that we wanted, um, we think it was primarily because it was too cold. We noticed nights it was in the high 30s, and no guys were spraying you know, the next day. Weeds aren't active then, okay? They're, they kind of shut down. So, cold, cloudy weather limits or slows translocation. <clears throat> Same for hot and dry, okay? So, we've, we're now in a hot, dry period. Uh, if we try to spray a systemic herbicide now, it's not going to move in the plant very well. Plants shut down. 
One thing that comes to mind is lamb's quarters. You guys ever tried to fight lamb's quarters when it's hot and dry? They're just like, what's that? You know, nothing will, will hurt a lamb's quarter when it's hot and dry. So you have to wait for that thing to get re-energized. And um, also uh, when it's sunny and moist. Uh, so use the full label grades. You know, we're not targeting big weeds anymore. We're going after small weeds, active weeds. Limit the witch's bruise. So let's decouple those residuals. Let's not put everything in the tank at once. Avoid uh, low temperatures at night and increase our GPA. Okay, get that GPA up around 15. Okay, MOA or SOA. Anybody know what that stands for? MOA. Mode of action. Yep. Okay, so we're talking about herbicide, but we could be talking about fungicide or insecticide. It's how it works in the plant. Okay. So atrazine, for example, is a photosynthetic inhibitor. That's what it does. That's how it works. Okay, and it inhibits photosynthesis. Okay. SOA, what does that stand for? Site of action. So that's where it works in the plant. Okay, so for atrazine, its mode of action is that it inhibits photosynthesis. Its site of action means that it inhibits it at the photosystem 2 pathway. There's an enzyme that it inhibits. So that's specifically where it, where it works. All right, so uh, real estate model, location, 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 right? You've all heard that. For you guys, the weed management model should be rotation, rotation, rotation. So you rotate your crop, you rotate your herbicide active ingredients, and then you rotate your sites of action. All right, so SOA stands for site of action. So the WSSA, okay, here's another acronym, Weed Science Society of America. I'm a card-carrying member of the Weed Science Society. It's a different society than that's in Colorado. That's a different weed society. <laughs> Their meetings don't start till after lunch, you know. <laughs> but uh, they came up with this idea. Let's assign a number to the herbicide site of action. Because it's much easier to remember a number than it is a chemical name, right? So if I said areloxyphenoxypropionates, or if I said family number one, which one are you going to remember? <laughs> You're going to remember one. Me too. Okay. So they assign numbers to all of our herbicides, which is great because where is that number? Where do you find that number, by the way? You have to go to a website. You have to call your neighbor, your applicator. Where do you find that number? Right on the label. Right on the front label. Right next to the brand name, there is a number there. So why is that important? Well, you don't want to use the same number all the time, right? That that does what? When you start doing that, so round Roundup's a good example. Resistance. Resistance. Okay. Roundup is in family nine. If you use the family nine over and over and over again, you're going to start selecting for resistance. So that's why they put those numbers on there so that you can make sure you're not using the same mode of action or side of action. Okay, so this is my this is my recommendation for the round of extend system. Those numbers right there. Okay, so you're done. So go. No, I'm just kidding. So let me explain to you which what we have here. So number four is the extend the max family or the growth regulator. So Banville, uh, Dicamba, 240, uh, Stinger, or those things are in family four. So extend the max is family four. Um, I told you, okay, family five. What's family five? That's the triazines. So things like atrazine. What's the triazine that we use in soybeans, though? Syncor. Syncor, good. Okay, you get a free lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> participation helps there, see? You can get a free lunch. So Syncor is a metribuzin, so that's a triazine. So we want to use that. Family nine, I told you, was Roundup. Family 14 is the burn type herbicides or the contact herbicides, things like Cobra, Blazer, Reflex, okay, Flexstar, right, all of those. And then 15 is something you guys have been using for years and years and years, the old lassos and duels, okay, uh, acetochlor, harness and corn. The acetochlor that we use in soybeans is called Warrant, okay, or you could use Duel, either one, or Zidua. So those are the families that we want to 
utilize in round of skin. So we got five different modes of action there, guys. Okay, that's how we're going to help delay resistance by using multiple modes of action. So here's an example, and I'll use my whiteboard here in a sec. But water hand, okay, it's quickly becoming the number one weed in the state. Uh, in my travels, I see it everywhere. Um, I have a really good plot near Elwood. It's solid uh, water hand, and I do a lot of research with it. And here's what I find. The best, right now, the best uh, recommendation for water hand is Extendamax. This would be like early post application. Extendamax with Warrant Ultra. So Warrant Ultra has Warrant, group 15, and the Ultra part of that is Flexstar, group 14. All right, so that tank mix is very effective. Notice I don't have Roundup up here because a lot of our, our water hemp is resistant to Roundup. So that's not going to help us, right? It'll help us on grass, but it won't help us on, on water. So we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, later. But that's, that's one way of looking at it. You've got three different modes of action there that snuffs out water hemp. <clears throat> so multiple effective modes of action help delay weed resistance. OK. Dicamba OTM, what's the OTM stand for? Off, target, movement. There you go, off target movement. Okay. Or simply grip, right? Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, there's four different ways we can have off target movement. Number one is simply spray grip. So that's when you're spraying, it's too windy and the particles drift off target, right? The second is tank contamination. So here, let's say you had some atrazine left in your tank and you went to spray soybeans and you know the first round or half a round you smoked beans. So that's that's off target movement too. Uh, then volatility, okay, that's where you spray it and a few hours later it picks up and then it moves. Okay, so that's volatility. And then runoff. Okay, a lot of people don't think about that, but well, we've had some big rains, haven't we? And uh, that can move water and soil. And uh, so I've seen where the water moves off the field into the neighbor's field, and you see a little channel there, and you can have manner injury too. So four different ways we can have off-target movement. All right, so I'm going to switch over now to this board here. So I talked earlier about the label. This is the label right here. Um, it's just it's all basically uh, uh, boiled down to these 12 steps. These are the 12 steps that you need to follow when you're spraying Extendamax, okay? So that we don't have any of these off-target movement things. Things like uh, not using AMS. I'll talk about that in a sec. Using the right tips. Uh, buffering to a downwind sensitive area. Uh, spraying small weeds and so on. Okay, these are the application requirements. And again, this is on that, that website, uh, extendmaxapplicationrequirements.com. So, these things work, okay? These work, we've tested them, they all work. The problem is, you must follow all 12. Because if you leave one out, uh, you break all of them, okay? It's kind of like the Ten Commandments. If you break one, you break them all, okay? So, you have to follow all 12. And, I think I have an example, yeah. So, um, I've had a couple of cases where I walk in fields with a farmer and we had some off-target movement to a neighbor. Okay, so he said, I used the right tips, I followed all of these things. Okay, so when did you spray? Um, well, it was two Fridays ago, it was uh, about 7.30 in the morning, beautiful morning. I mean, calm, blue skies, it's perfect for spray. Okay, some of you guys are saying, what's wrong with that scenario? Calm, right? We don't want to spray when it's calm because that's all a lot. An inversion. I'm going to shut this door so we can see this slide. Painted really intimate. See the slide. Okay. So this is a weather inversion. So when you have really dead calm conditions, uh, the weather flips. So you have this is a uh, taken in the evening, but you can see it in the morning, right? Did we have an inversion this morning? Absolutely. On my way over here from West Lafayette, there was fog above the beans. And so what we have, we have cool air below, warm air above. So if you walk into your bean field, it feels kind of cool, but 100 feet up, it's going to be warmer. So it just, it just did a flip. And so when you have that occurring, you have this 
layer right there, and this layer is where particles can get trapped. So even when you're spraying with these big droplets here, about 1% to 1.5% of those uh, droplets are fine, and they can get caught in this, this layer right there. And then where do they go? Who knows? <laughs> Wherever the wind wants to blow it later on, okay? So in a weather inversion, any herbicide can get trapped right there, okay? Any herbicide. Right? Because if any kind of a small droplet can get caught there. The problem with dicamba is that beans are so sensitive to it that that's where you know, you're going to see it go. So we could have Roundup go off target in an inversion. We could have Halix GT. We could have any herbicide. But you're not going to see the symptoms because the crops and the weeds are, are more tolerant to it. But not with dicamba. And the soybeans are very sensitive. So this is a weather inversion. Okay? So any, any herbicide can... Can, uh, can be caught and they can trap in, those, uh, in that layer. Um, if you think now, well, I guess there's like three states that have now said you can't spray uh, before nine or after three, and that's because of this weather inversion thing, okay? Because that's when you get that flip and you get that layer there, and they want you to avoid that. So this is, sounds weird, but wind is our friend with a weather inversion. So we want some. Wind. We want you know a good three, four, five mile per hour, up to six, eight, whatever. That's good enough that helps drive those particles to the target and you don't get that layer form. Okay, volatility versus inversion. So volatility is something a little bit different. This is primarily the herbicide, how the herbicide is formulated. So Banville is very volatile. Okay? Uh, it goes from a liquid to a gas and it escapes to the atmosphere. So a high vapor pressure, okay, band, very volatile, that's why vandal is not allowed to be sprayed over the top of beans. Uh, if you add AMS or any acidifiers to the tank, that lowers the pH of the tank, that creates more hydrogen, and the hydrogen binds with the dicamba and causes dicamba acid or forms dicamba acid, and that's what's volatile, the dicamba acid. So that's a no-no, that's why you can't use AMS, okay. Uh, heat drives this reaction. So in the south, when they've had 98 degree days and they've seen some off-target movement, that's why, okay? Because heat drives that reaction. Um, let me give you another example. So some of you guys are older in here. Do you remember uh, Sutan Plus, Eradicane, uh, even Command? It wasn't too long ago. What did we have to do with those products? Incorporate. We had to incorporate right away because they did what? Or they would have done what? They moved. They would have volatilized, right? So you have to incorporate them right away. So those products, uh, high vapor pressure, they needed to be incorporated into the soil right away. So that's a, that's the whole point of volatility. So it occurs probably in the first couple days after you spray. Again, depending on that uh, temperature. Uh, the symptoms though don't occur until much later on. So you can have an off-target movement from volatility. Uh, but that, you may not see the symptoms in soybeans for a couple of weeks. Same with spray drift. Uh, if you're out spraying and you see some of your drops hit your neighbor's beans and you go there the next day and you don't see any symptoms, you're like, oh, good, what? <laughs> you know, dodge that bullet. Well, two weeks later, you're going to see symptoms, or maybe less. So it doesn't happen right away. So inversion, then again, any herbicide can be affected with inversion. Small droplets don't reach their target. Uh, evenings and mornings again, uh, clear skies, calm winds, dew on the leaves, fog, all of those are indications that you have an inversion. Uh, now, some states, as I mentioned, limit the time of day of applications. Okay, a couple of quick slides here um, to show you this whole volatility thing. So, here's a demonstration where I sprayed Extendamax on Roundup soybeans. So, what's it going to do to Roundup soybeans? <laughs> going to kill them. Yep. And I surely did, right there. So uh, these are around the soybeans, and there's my four dead <coughs> ribs. So I, sprayed, I sprayed 10 feet, killed four dead ribs. Uh, the wind speed was about three miles per hour, pretty light that morning. It was about 8.30 in the morning when I sprayed. Uh, temperature reached about 85 degrees that day. Okay. Here's the adjacent row, right next to that. So did that row get affected? 
Yeah, so I had some droplets hit that roof. Okay, so I'm I'm pretty good sprayer, but not that good. Okay, uh, so I had a little bit here on that adjacent roof. But look at these other seven roofs that are next to it. Okay, they're pretty much normal. Okay, they don't have any hardly any symptomology. The cup I'm looking for the cup. So again, if this was volatile, it would have picked up in that first 48 hours, and it would have settled on these rows all around here and caused cup. Okay? That's with Extendamax that has a vapor grip technology. Now I spray clarity. You can't read that sign there, it's clarity. Okay? Four dead rows, adjacent row. Now look at the other rows. They're all cut. Okay? So we had some movement with clarity because it's volatile. Not real volatile, but you know, slightly volatile. Um, and then I really screwed it up and I added AMS with clarity. Now look, I've got cupping everywhere. Not only cupping, but I've stunted it, didn't I? If you look at these rows, notice the dark green color. I'll go back here. One more. Nice light green color, taller, and now I've stunted them pretty good. So this just means there was a higher dose of clarity that, that uh, volatilized. So you do not use AMS with any dicamba product because you will get more volatility. Okay, um, I'm going to open up the door now. So any questions that you have on that subject? Um, so I will briefly, how much time do I have? A couple minutes. Alright, so I talked about water, right? And this could be uh, probably the same for giant ragweed too. So for water hemp, what I want to do is I'm going to start pre, uh, and I'm going to use uh, something like a, a Valor or Authority Brands, something like that, pre. Okay. Again, water hemp. This is what we're we're going after. I don't have a burn down there because if you're planting before May 15th, it's likely you're not going to have water hemp up at that time. Okay? Uh, you'll have mare's tail and you might have ragweed, but you won't have water hemp. It comes up generally after uh, the soil temperatures get warm enough. So Valor Authority, these are very good. Um, Freeze, they're in the PPO family, family 14. Okay, I can't write backwards here. Family 14. Um, so this will give you... Uh, Pretty long control, okay? You're going to get uh, a good probably six weeks out of that. And then when your time comes for your early post, then you want to look at Extendamax plus Roundup, which is what we call a Power Max. And then <laughs> Warrant Ultra. Okay. So we have group four, group nine, group 14, and 15, right there. This combination, guys, is very, very effective. Because if you just if we just use Extendamax, it's pretty good. But it's one of those, is it going to die? Is it going to live? It's kind of hard to tell. What dicamba does is it, it curls the plant under. Uh, the beans are actively growing. It can shade it. That's, that's perfect. If they're not, though, you know, they may, they may keep growing. So then we put that Warrant Ultra in there, and that knocks them out. Okay, that's a burner type contact material. Uh, this combination works very well. I've been very impressed with how this works on water. This would also do very well on giant ragweed too, because you've got two different ways that you're you're hitting that plant. So from a water hit standpoint, this would be my my recommendation. Uh, at this point, we've got number three will be can. Okay, so uh, 15 inch rows certainly would help canopy the rows, and you got clean beans to harvest. Right? Okay, yes, sir. Is that a good uh, combination for mare's tail? Okay, sort of. Uh, for mare's tail, we want to be up here. We want to be more worried about the burn down. And so now we want to move that extended mass up here in that burn down, because that's when mare's tail um, is up, and uh, we want to knock it out at, at burn down. 
We can, we can work on it in early post, but I want to make sure we get rid of it up here. And you can use these residuals, but I like, I like metribuzin also. About five ounces of metribuzin with one of these and Extendamax works really good on, on, on mirror stem. All right, thank you very much. And yes, one more. Another question about fall burn down. Yeah, I've been told to control mirror stem, you need to wait until a frost before you do your fall burn down. But earlier you said that uh, for water hemp, that is not the thing to do. Uh, for water hemp, you were saying the plant needs to be actively growing. Yeah. No cold nights. Right, so that means before frost to me. Yeah, so for water hemp, fall applications is not going to work because it's it's not a winter animal. It's already put out seed and it's already dead by or after you get a frost. It's the mare's tail and winter annuals that we want to hit in the fall. The water hemp is not going to come up until, you know, start germinating May 15th. So it's, it's early summers when we're going to hit water. Oh, no, I misunderstood. Yeah. I, I was thinking you were going after water hemp. No, no. Okay. No, no, it's no. fall, it's mare's tail, um, chickweed, dandelions, those types of things. Yeah. You, using what product? Uh, so Roundup, Dicamba, 2,4-D. It doesn't have to be these real expensive okay. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm sure everybody here is worried about it. Should we be scared of this? Okay, you know, we're hearing a lot of stories. I don't know if the media's putting it out there just to freak people out or what's going on. <laughs> I'll be honest. Well, yeah, so. And, and there's that a lot of people that bought and, and didn't even use a chemical on it because yeah. they're worried about it. Yeah. We didn't. Right, right. So that's, that's perfectly fine. Go ahead and buy the beans. You can just spray around it on them or any of these other herbicides. That's fine. I'm not going to get mad if you don't use extended no, yeah. I'm just asking, is yeah. it just a bunch of hype through the media, or is there a problem? Or is it the farmer's fault? What are we doing wrong here? What's well, going on? Yeah, so what I try to do is educate on what we learned this year. Right. Um, and so with some of, the, some of the cases where we've had, we didn't follow the application requirements, um, it was obvious some of these weren't followed. And so we, you know, we said, hey, let's, let's, let's not spray in the morning, you know, because of the inversion. Or and, and some of these weren't the setbacks weren't followed. They were spraying right up next to a living field. Okay. I don't care which way the wind's blowing. I don't want to do that. You know. I want to make sure that I'm um, a good steward of the technology. So yes, there is a lot of bad press out there. Um, this is my fourth launch of the technology, and every year there's always something that goes wrong. Uh, when Round and Pretty Beans first came out, we smoked a lot of corn. You know that that Roundup drifted a long ways, and you know we didn't pluck our leaves; we killed. Them. So it's it's a learning year, definitely. And you know who knows? Maybe the EPA says you know we heard enough, and, and now we're going to restrict its use. Maybe you can't spray it after uh, or before nine o'clock you know, or something. Like that. I don't know what that's going to look like, but. I guess it's maybe bad news travels fast, or like people like to read bad news. But we've had a lot of great success with it that just doesn't hit the right. Front page. And that's what we're curious. You know, yeah. curious about. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very good. Very good point. Well, what, what is what is the cost of the Stendamax per acre? I mean, I, I I planted the beans, but I issued Roundup. Yeah. But what is the actual cost per acre of that? So that's I can't answer that. Because I'm not, uh, I'm not sales. Okay. <laughs> so, um, it's going to, uh, it's going to depend on some of the packages with the residual herbicides. So we have a program called Roundup Ready Plus. You'll get rebates back, like three or four bucks an acre. Right. And, and that kind of thing. So I would say it's probably in that ten to fifteen dollar range per acre. 